Okay, hello teams. If you're viewing this video, that means that you guys have gotten all the way through the green unit, which is hemoglobin structure function. Uh, that you should really be proud of yourself because that is a lot of material that you have gone through. And so what I want to do now is just to really kind of tie together some loose ends, make sure that you understand some of the concepts that you learned in this unit. But as far as I'm concerned, if you get this to this point, you guys from here on can start deciding what your project's going to be because you have such a good idea of how hemoglobin works and globins work in general that now you can start going in a lot of different directions. But before you do that, let's talk about some of these concepts and make sure that, that you have a, a good idea of what's, what's going on here. Now, in the last unit, which was the yellow unit, I believe, um, you, taught, you, you really learned a lot about myoglobin and that was really helpful because you got the, the basic idea of how a globin functions and how oxygen binds to the iron in the heme group and the slight change in conformation that happens when that, when that occurs. Um, myoglobin though is very, very simple because it's only one subunit and so its function doesn't really change with oxygen binding and that's not the case with hemoglobin. So now we're going to step to a more complex uh, situation and talk about hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin, as you should have learned, is a tetramer. So it is um, a protein that's made up of four globin proteins, unlike myoglobin. And those, those globin proteins are two different kinds of globins. And you've, you've done some, uh, some sequence analysis and comparison of alpha and beta. And those are the, the globins that make up hemoglobin. And how it turns out is that, um, as you saw, alpha and beta globin are very similar in structure and in sequence, but they are slightly different. And it turns out that because of these differences, alpha and beta, so this is alpha and this is beta, um, they actually like to form a dimer with each other. They would much rather bind to each other than bind with another another unit like themselves okay and that forms a heterodimer so beta or hemoglobin is made up of two alpha beta heterodimers and these are very um, bound pretty tightly to each other and then these heterodimers bind to each other um, a little bit more loosely so they bind by salt bridges so bonds between uh, uh, positively charged amino acids and negatively charged, am charged amino acids. I mean, you should have learned about that when you did your protein folding uh, amino acid starter kit activity back in the, in the orange unit, I think. Um, so that should, should be an understandable topic for you. If not, you might want to go back and review. But so that's, so that's what happens is beta globin has these, um, you know, these, these salt bridges that, that hold hemoglobin into this specific conformation. But um, there is something called allosteri that takes place in hemoglobin. Now allosteri is a concept that you may have heard before. You may have heard this when you uh, learned about enzymes. Sometimes there are things called allosteric inhibitors. Um, so what allosteri is, is just something that happens in proteins that have multiple subunits like this, or that can happen. It doesn't always happen. But proteins that have multiple subunits can some, it sometimes exist in more than one conformation. And it, they can change that conformation depending upon ligands or substances that can bind to them that will then cause them to ship conformation. So in enzymes, if you have an allosteric inhibitor, that is a substance that can bind somewhere in the enzyme, cause the conformation to change, and that inhibits the function, the normal function of that enzyme, okay? In this case, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, and we'll talk about what that, that um, allosteric ligand, the, the thing that binds to cause conformational change in a bit. But first I want you to just understand the two conformations of hemoglobin. So as I said, there is this alpha beta and alpha beta, um, these dimers that come together and they form these uh, salt bridges and these connections in this one uh, 
confirmation. And this, this confirmation happens to be something known as deoxyhemoglobin. It's the hemoglobin where no oxygen is bound. And it happens to be a confirmation that um, has a very low affinity for oxygen binding. So it's very happy, it's very stable in this, in this confirmation, and really um, does not, the hemes are not really available very easily to, to bind oxygen. Now there's another confirmation where these, these um, salt bridges are broken and the, um, the structure kind of rotates, okay? So it kind of goes from a more open structure to a little bit more closed, but that kind of opens up the heme groups and allows for oxygen to bind easier at that point. So this can be called the oxyhemoglobin state. Another name that you might hear about if you do some reading on this um, about the two states is the T state. So the T state is known as a tight state. When there's these, these um, salt bridges, that's kind of the T state, the deoxyhemoglobin state. And then the relaxed state, the R state, where oxygen can bind. So those are the two conformations that hemoglobin switches back and forth between. Okay, now what causes that? Well, as I said, in allosteric, a ligand has to bind. And it turns out in, in hemoglobin, that happens to be oxygen. So even though the <clears throat> deoxy state does not really have a high affinity, it doesn't like to bind oxygen, when the hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, goes into the lungs, where there's a lot of oxygen, oxygen is going to bind to these, to these irons. And so um, I think uh, I talked about it in, the, in, the, um, in this unit. Um, Max Perutz had a great quote when he talked about how oxygen binds to hemoglobin. And he said that hemoglobin molecules are reluctant to take up the first oxygen molecule, but their appetite for oxygen grows with the eating. And I thought that was just a really cool analogy. So once one oxygen binds to a heme, the other oxygens can bind more readily. Well, how does, and that's called, that's a, a, a thing that's called cooperativity. It's cooperative binding of oxygen. One oxygen binding makes all the other oxygens bind more easily. Okay, so before, before we explore what happens in the hemoglobin, we have to remind ourselves what's happening just to the heme molecule itself, right? I mean, we talked about this in the last unit. Um, remember these heme molecules that um, there's one heme unit in every globin. So these heme molecules have an iron at the center. And remember we said that that iron is slightly above the plane of the heme. And what happens when oxygen binds is that oxygen pulls that heme, or it pulls that iron in more into the plane of the heme. And what happens when that, when that occurs is that it then pulls the proximal histidine amino acid. And remember what we said about that, the proximal histidine, here's the oxygen binding here, the proximal histidine is attached to the F alpha helix. And so when that pulls against the histidine, it's going to pull this whole helix down and change the conformation of that one globin. Now, when that happens in myoglobin, not much happens because it's just one subunit. But when that happens in a tetramer like hemoglobin, it's got a chain reaction then, right? So it's going to start causing conformational changes across the molecule. And what happens is that change, so that tension on this F helix here is going to cause those salt bridges to break. And that's what holds it in that deoxy conformation. But once those break, that causes this shift to the, to the oxygen, oxygenated conformation or the R conformation. And that makes all the other hemes more readily pick up oxygen. So that's a good thing because when this hemoglobin molecule is in a red blood cell that's going through your lungs, you want it to be able to pick up oxygen very, very quickly. And so that switch, that, 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 that um, conformational change is what allows hemoglobin to get saturated, 
pick up as much oxygen as it can, okay? Then it can take it to the cells and the muscles and the, all, the, all the tissues that need oxygen, which is all of our cells, and then release it at, at, that, at that place. So we talked about how the deoxygenated hemoglobin or the T state is a very stable state, right? It's got these, these salt bridges that kind of hold it in place, but it also has something else that keeps it in that state. And that's something called BPG, bisphosphoglycerate, okay? And um, you can kind of see it on this model. It, it, to me, it, so it's basically a phosphate group, a phosphorus with some oxygens around it at e each end, and then carbon and oxygen on the inside. It kind of looks like a little barbell to me, right, with phosphates on the ends. And that is um, a molecule that is in our red blood cells and it, um, it binds to um, a histidine, actually two histidines and a lysine on each beta globin. And by doing that, it basically holds that hemoglobin in the deoxygenated state, right? It keeps it from uh, picking up oxygen very easily. So what happens is when hemoglobin then goes to the lungs, where it's surrounded by lots of oxygen, um, it's, it will pick up oxygen because there's such a great um, uh, excess of oxygen around. And what happens is as soon as it binds to that first heme, heme group, it pops that um, bisphosphoglycerate off, and then that kind of unlocks it, and then it allows it to make that conformational change like we said. Now the interesting thing about bisphosphoglycerate, though, is that it is it binds to adult hemoglobin, but it doesn't bind to fetal hemoglobin. And now let's think about why that would be interesting. Now, fetal hemoglobin, um, because it does, it has, it's missing a, one of those histidines that I talked about. And so it binds BPG or bisphosphoglycerate to some extent, but not nearly as strongly as adult does. And because of that, that means that oxygen can jump on to hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, much easier. It's got a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin is what the fetus produces during gestation. So when the mother blood is circulating, um, the, the mother's blood, the oxygen in the mother's blood is what has to um, feed, basically, or um, serve the fetus because the fetus doesn't have lungs yet, the fetus is not breathing, um, so all the oxygen that the fetus gets has to come from the mother's blood. Now, if the fetus had the same hemoglobin as the adult, it would be really hard to get oxygen to transfer from hemoglobin to hemoglobin. But because uh, the adult hemoglobin binds it less strongly than the fetal hemoglobin, because of this, this BPG, it is more easily transferred to the fetal hemoglobin. And it's a very, very important difference that um, has happened over evolution and it's, it's critical to the survival of, of a fetus for nine months in the, in the mother's womb. All right, so that's a really, really interesting story and that's an interesting topic that you might want to go further on with your project because all these things that we're talking about are very deep concepts, and we're just kind of giving you a surface understanding of them. But I think um, the more you the more you get excited about these different topics, hopefully you'll decide that that's what you what you might want to study for your model, and um, and and research that. So that's pretty much it for the green unit. There are a lot of concepts that um, that are pretty deep in this unit. Um, there may be a lot of questions. You may have more questions now than you did before you started this unit, and that's a good thing because, you know, there, it, there's, it's so rich with really interesting concepts that there are so many different ways that you can go for your project. But now if you're really still interested in, in pushing forward and finding more out about the genetics and genetic um, alterations that can happen in hemoglobin and disorders that can occur because of these changes, that's all in the blue unit. So please continue um, with those activities if you're really interested in, in, in pushing forth that way. But for some of you, this may be as far as you want to go and you want to start your project at this point. That's fine too. 
as a team, you guys decide which way you want to go. And, um, and I'll be back with you a little bit to talk about how to start designing your, your research projects. All right, great, thanks.